Uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting with verse 19. There is a uh, thing about being a Christian and being involved in Christian service. Uh, Christianity and the service that you may render to the Lord is all volunteer. Did you get that? It's all volunteer. It's not a legal thing. You, you choose to say, Lord, I, I'm available, or you choose not to. God will love you either way, you know, and uh, but it is a volunteer thing. Nobody takes it from us. In other words, uh, I'm not under obligation because somebody else legalizes me to do anything because of uh, that. I am and I am uh, I respond to what God has done for me, the way that God touches my heart according to what I want to do with the Lord. Gail Irwin, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if, I think Gail's still amongst us, but he's an older, early Calvary Chapel pastor, and uh, he wrote a book called The Jesus Style, and then he wrote The Spirit Style. But The Jesus Style became quite a staple for Calvary Chapels, and The Jesus Style was about the nature of Jesus, you know, that he was humble, that he was meek, that he was a servant. But one of the things that Gail brought up in his book constantly was, nobody takes this from us. This is something that we willingly do. And if he didn't want to do it, or you don't want to do it, then you don't have to do it. But God invites us to do certain things, and again, that's our choice whether we choose to take the invitation that the Lord is placing upon us uh, in front of us of service or love or the things that we do. Now, this is not for those who are married. You took a, you know, a vow, so that's, that's not you know, something you opt out of, but Christian service and loving one another and all those things. We should and ought to do those things. But again, I am not having my arm twisted in a sense of, you know, go be burned up for Jesus. No, I willingly do uh, what I am will to do in a manner of speaking. I am not a pastor because it was something that uh, I decided was going to make me a lot of money. <laughs> Laughter. Uh, you know, um, I was called very early on, but God did not obligate me. He invited me. And he said, this is what I've called you to do. Will you do it? And I said, yes, I will do it. I've had many doubts and fears over the years about that. And finally, settled some issues with the Lord, but uh, he didn't tell me, this is what you will do. This is the way you're going to do it. No, he invited me and he said, do you love me? And I said, yeah, I, I love you. I, I've dedicated my life to you. Then come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Those are my verses for my calling. Okay, but it's something that I do. It's something that I continue to do. It is my choice, my wife's choice for what we do. It is not something where somebody twists our arm and says, you have to do this. I don't. I choose to do it. And I'm glad to do it. Because I've never got a better deal in my life than the love of Jesus Christ. And even in my service to him, he's never forsaken us. In fact, he's shown us great things in the midst of uh, our lives and our walk with him. The good and the bad. The things that I understood, the things that we don't understand. But he is 100% and always faithful.
That's our experience. That's my experience. But then again, you're you. And you have your call in front of you. Paul was the same way. We pick up today, and Paul did what Paul did because he chose to do it, not because he was obligated in the sense of legalized to do certain things, but he was a man that was a go-getter, if you would have it. He wanted to optimize the love of God in his life and the call that had been placed upon his life to what? See people get saved to build the kingdom of heaven. He had one singular purpose in his life, and that was it. So in our text today, that's where we start out in verse uh, 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you're there, if you're scrolling through your iPad, or you are actually got white pages, or where, wherever you're at, uh, we'll pick up and we'll read uh, five verses. He's, he says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as with." as without law, not being without law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. So that's our text for the day from this book. Obviously, in my, you know, my style of teaching, we know we're going to go all over the place. But uh, um, Paul says, hey, I am free from all men. He wasn't obligated. He had absolute freedom and liberty. He says, but I have made myself a servant to all. He did it. Not somebody else did it. He did it. Now we know, for those of us who've been in the Bible for a long time, or any length of time, if you read Acts, God shows him the things he's going to suffer. He shows him his call. He places it upon him. But I don't believe that God obligated him to that. That was a call given by God that Paul couldn't resist. He couldn't resist it because the love of God constrained him to sign up on the dotted line to become such a volunteer. And so this is what he says, is I am a volunteer and I volunteer to be a servant to all men. That's pretty amazing, you know, to be a servant to all men, everybody that he met. He felt like he had an obligation to them that they might get saved. That he had an obligation to share the gospel with those people. To do his utmost to try to win those people. And so he gives us a text here, or um, a context of what? I became a Jew to the Jews, that I might win some. I became, you know, under the law that I might win those who are under the law. You know, and he goes on and he explains all of these different things. And much of this is taken out of context, you know, in uh, certain circles of the church that, you know, I go back and I get myself and wrapped up in sin that I might win a sinner. That's not what Paul wrote. That's not what he taught. He's talking about a lifestyle that he would put away certain things to sit with a group of people that he might get to share the gospel with that group of people. Okay. Um, he said, the servant of all, the goal that I might win the more. And he ultimately says that they might be saved. He realized he was a vessel, a vehicle through which God would do what? 
bring salvation to others. He understood he did not save people. He didn't die for them. But he died to himself that they might hear the message of the gospel, that they might be saved. We are participants in the same thing. Absolutely 100% the same thing. We don't save anybody, but at the same time, without us sharing the gospel, then guess what? Who will get saved? No one. Creation testifies of a creator, but it doesn't testify of a savior. We know that. Romans chapter 1. The preaching of Jesus Christ the cross, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ, his what? His payment on the cross for me is necessary for people to get saved. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. That message is absolutely 100% necessary for the people that are going to get saved. That's why there is such a battle today and has been over the centuries, even millennium, for the gospel. The Satan tries to silence those who are preachers and do what? Why? Because if the gospel goes forth, it bears fruit and what? It destroys the kingdom of darkness and builds the kingdom of God. That's just the nature of the way that it works, right? And so he does everything he possibly can to shut up the people of God, to get us chasing our chails, to divide us, to do all kinds of different things to keep us from doing what? Presenting the gospel in unity to the world. And yet that's what Paul taught, was what? We should have a unified message to the world as the church. That's Paul's goal. That's the way that he put it. But for his life, he said, okay, I put away my personal rights for the sake to win somebody else. I remember driving down, uh, and I may have said this recently. I don't know. I talk so much sometimes, uh, you know. But uh, I was uh, working with a guy that was very angry guy, very angry we were surveying together this many years ago, and uh, the guy hated Christians. He hated me. He hated everything about God and everything else, and yet he had grown up in a religious home. And uh, I remember driving down the road with this guy, and I wanted to share the gospel with him, and the Holy Spirit very clearly told me, don't bother. He said, can't you sense the wall between you and him? Yeah, I guess I can. Well, don't bother. Okay. I wasn't going to breach that wall. I wasn't going anywhere with this guy. About a year later, we have to drive all the way from San Diego up to Tustin, which is about 100 miles one way. A lot of windshield time. And in our case, a lot of quiet windshield time. You know, <laughs> And we went up there and did some work, and he still aided me. I mean, he critiqued me so bad. He just, uh, he, was, he was a thorn in my flesh, and, you know. But on the way back, there was a crack. There was a fissure. And he opened up the door, and he said, you know, my problem with the church is, you know, abortion. A woman's right to choose. You know, all the, the different arguments that could be made. And I'm sitting there going, all right, Lord, how do I respond to this? Because it's easy to get into a sidebar argument. We have a lawyer in this, this uh, congregation, uh, you know, and go off on a tangent somewhere else, but not keep the main issue the main issue. And I turned to him, and it had to be the wisdom of God. I said, the bottom line, his name was Gary. What are you going to do about Jesus? I said, he died for you. And he died for your sins. And he rose from the dead. And he's coming back. 
What are you going to do with Jesus? These other issues, they're peripheral. What are you going to do with Jesus? That was the end of the conversation, but it, 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 it did something. It did something, and it gave me the opportunity to share very succinctly, bluntly, but I had to wait. I had to wait a long time. It was almost like I had to win the right <laughs> to uh, share with them. And many of us have had that same experience where, you know, we initially want to share with somebody, but it's like the door never opens and they're never going to give us a time of day. And over a period of time of love and prayer and patience, guess what? The door opens up and we get the opportunity to share the what? the message of salvation with them, the message of the Savior with that person. Don't ever give up, folks. Keep praying. Keep hoping, right? And, uh, you know, Paul was that kind of a guy. He went into places that were totally foreign to Christianity, pagan places. I oh, certainly got to go into the synagogues and share with the Jews, and he did. But he felt a lot of rejection there, even in Corinth, right? But he felt it was necessary for him to meet the people where they were, not in a sinful sense, but in a cultural sense that he might win them. That he might win them. He, uh, he did this in Acts chapter 21. Verses 18 through 26, his last trip to Jerusalem, he goes there and uh, he comes and shares with the church of Jerusalem and James, who was the pastor of that church, the Lord's half-brother, and he comes and he shares. And they tell him, hey, take the Nazarite vow. There's a bunch of guys going to go take a Nazarite vow. Why don't you pay their expenses and go with them? Now, Paul understood he was not under the law. He understood the law didn't give him his righteousness. He's a great writer of the book of Romans. Obviously, a shorter version of kind of the same thing, the book of Galatians, about justification by faith. In fact, if you want to know, uh, this is my little secret, and I don't even know where I picked it up. But if you want to know, you want to, there's three different books that deal with one verse in the Bible. It's an Old Testament verse. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Well, who are the just? That's the book of Romans. How do you become righteous? The book of Romans tells us, how shall I live? Well, the book of Galatians tells us by the Spirit of God. So how should I live? By the Spirit of God, by the work of God's Spirit in my life. That doesn't ignore the Word of God. I'm just saying by the empowerment of the Spirit is how I'm supposed to live my, way, my life. By faith. What's the book of faith in the New Testament, folks? Hebrews. How am I supposed to live? By faith. So study the book of Hebrews, you'll know how to live by faith. Study the book of Galatians, you'll know how to live, what? By the empowerment of the Spirit. And if you study the book of Romans, at least the first eight chapters, you will know how to be justified, accepted by God through faith. Okay, there's Bible studies over. Go home. Read Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. But... Paul understood that, hey, you know what? I'm going to become, they were very, James was more legalistic in the sense of keeping the law of Moses, even as a believer. And so he wanted to have Paul smooth over, you know, some rough areas where they said that Paul ignored the book of Moses, you know, the law. And so uh, he uh, gets obligated, and he says, okay, I'll take the vow. I'll go. It didn't help him. When he got in there, when he went to go pay his vow, guess what? 
they saw him and they called a, called an uproar against him. They tried to kill him while he was in there. While he was in the temple precincts, they trumped up some charges against him. And so it, it didn't help him. It helped him amongst the believers that they would hear his testimony, but it didn't help him in Jerusalem whatsoever. You know, and he spent a couple of years uh, legal defense, legal battles, you know, in Jerusalem and later in Caesarea, you know, bearing witness of what Jesus Christ had done and his call from God. In Acts 16, 1 through 3, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Rista, Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for a, they all knew that his father was a Greek. Um, the point being is he had Timothy circumcised so that Timothy would be able to go in the synagogue with him without offending the Jews and present the gospel to them. Wasn't that it saved Timothy or made him any better? Because we know in the book of, uh, actually, um, 1 Corinthians, it tells us circumcision matters not one way or the other. If you're circumcised, that's okay. No problem. But don't go get circumcised to justify yourself before the Lord because it doesn't work. Galatians says the same thing. Then you're obligated to keep the whole law, and that's another whole argument aside from this. But the, the point being is people accommodate certain things for certain reasons. How many of you have been to Israel? I've been there. David's been there. There's a few. If you go to Israel, you have to observe certain things. If you go to Israel, there is what? The Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day, you observe certain things that the Jews do. You take a different elevator than normally you would take, you know, you uh, you don't travel by vehicle on the Sabbath, you know, because you're not supposed to kindle a fire. And to some of us, it would seem very foolish and stupid and, you know, excuse the term. But to us, New Testament Christians, we're like, this is dumb. Well, it's not dumb to them. It's what they grew up with. They're trying to keep the law. And we're supposed to love them. And so guess what? When we go to Israel, we put away our personal rights. Otherwise, you get thrown out of the country, you know. But we don't disrespect them. We respect them where they're at. And if you go there, you will find that to be the case. And... Uh, there's the other thing when you go to what they call the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. You have to uh, um, put on a, a kippah. And they have them there and you put it on your head. It's a little skull cap. Many of you have seen you know, maybe Ben Shapiro. He wears one on a regular basis. And you put it on your head and you go down there and you go to the Western Wall. Why would you do that? doesn't add anything to me, maybe cover up a bald spot, I don't know, but doesn't add anything to me. But for the sake of conscience, guess what? I do it. I do it. And so we know these things to be true. Well, that's what Paul was doing. He was meeting people culturally where they were at for the sake of, to present the gospel to them, right? He was a Roman citizen. He was a Jew. But guess what? He had no problem eating Gentile food. He didn't. And I don't know how he worked this out amongst mixed congregations. I really don't. But he did, and this is what, you know, um, he did. 
you know, was he tried to meet people where they were at so that he could present the gospel to them. You know, and in our culture, in our society, guess what? Sometimes I, I read from a book, we want God to skin the fish and then we'll bring them into our, what, our church. You know, we want them to be all clean and tidied up and we want them to socially fit into our version of whatever social Christianity is. And Jesus didn't do that. You ever touched a leper? No, thank God you haven't, right? Most of you never met a leper, neither have I. Jesus didn't heal them from a distance. How did he heal them? He put his hands on them, right? He put his hands on them. And sometimes we're a little squeamish. I went to go pick up a man this morning. He called me yesterday. His name is Philip. You might pray for him. The battle's not over. But uh, he called me up and uh, he wanted some benevolence, some money. And I told him what I normally tell people is uh, if you, uh, we don't give out benevolence to people that don't come to our church. But I said, if you'll show up at our church, then guess what? I'll present your need to the body. And guess what? I bet God will meet your need. And so he said, uh, you know, I'll be at church. So he called me this morning and said, I need a ride. Ten minutes later, I'm down where he's at. At least the area that he told me he was at. And, but in our conversation yesterday, he's, he's uh, spent time in prison. He has to ride a bike because he lost his license. And he's backslidden. I told him, well, there's no time to be right with the Lord than today. I said, you need to get plugged into a church and you need to start growing in the Lord. I said, that's the way that this works. God is forgiving. God is merciful. God is gracious. And I said, the money issue is a, almost a non-issue. This is what God is using to try to draw you to himself. So I showed up and he answered the phone and he said, I, 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 I. Satan had already snatched the seed. And yesterday he was telling me about all the churches that wouldn't reach out to him and all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, Satan's a liar. So I, I'm not telling you to condemn him. I'm just saying pray for him. Because the battle rages. The battle rages. God wants to reach Phillips and other people on every social stratum that there is. God is not a respecter of what? Persons. He desires all men, all women to be saved. Those in the halls of justice and those down at the mission. He died for sinners, of which we all come in that category, right? So, um, Paul was not, in a sense, earning salvation. He understood that he was already saved. But he wanted others to get saved. He says that he uh, was not without law. He says in verse 21, To those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. In other words, <laughs> no legal, you know, ramifications in their lives of how to please God, and if you would have it. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 18 and 19 was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commands of God is what matters. We're not lawless. Christianity is not lawlessness. Matter of fact, in the New Covenant, 
that God spoke about in Jeremiah 31, and I will read it to you. And this is the New Covenant, the New Testament, if you would have it. He says, 31, 31 through 34 in Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. What was the old covenant? If you keep the law, I will bless you. If you don't keep the law, off with your head. No, just kidding. You know, they were obligated to keep the law. They couldn't keep the law. God already knew they couldn't keep the law. And so we get reflections of faith in the Old Testament, even under the Old Covenant. David was justified by what? By faith, not by the law. The law condemned David. Absolutely 100% condemned him. And yet he said, Lord, happy is a man whom the Lord does not impute unrighteousness. Doesn't leave it on his account. And that's used by Paul in Romans and Galatians to teach us about justification by faith from the Old Testament, from a man under the law. So people were still justified in the Old Testament by what? By faith, not by law. God knew they couldn't keep the law. The law was to lead them to the end of themselves that they would put their faith in God's provision of a Messiah yet to come. So, he says, I'll make a new covenant. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which... They broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. That is the new covenant written by Jeremiah, spoken by Jeremiah, of which God said that is yet future to come. It came through Jesus Christ. It came through Jesus Christ. And so uh, that is the new covenant is, guess what? God would write his laws and give me a new nature to walk with him. Is that in perfection? No, it's not in perfection. I wish it was. I wouldn't wake up with my battles, you know? And I do. And I have to work out this walk by faith, even though, guess what? I struggle with sin, but there is what? Provision for me. There is always provision. And the provision is what? John writes to us very clearly. He says, I write these things that you may not sin. But if anybody sins, and I thank God for the W, we have an advocate with the Father. He didn't say, you do. I'm perfect. He said, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous who was the propitiation for our sins. That's a technical term about the mercy seat of God where Jesus' blood was offered in heaven. At the mercy seat on our behalf. Jesus Christ the righteous, the propitiation, the payment for my sins. And he had already said, guess what? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Good news. Good news. Right? Restoration is what? Is my agreement with God that yes, I fall short. I fall short. I ask for your forgiveness. Guess what? At that point, it takes me a little while to catch up depending on the sin. But as far as God's concerned, it's done. Sober. It's no longer on a rap sheet. That's good news. That's the gospel, right? 
then maybe your prayer is, oh, renew a right spirit within me. That's mine. Lord, not only forgive me, but give me the power to walk with you so I don't have to keep revisiting this place. Right? So, how are we under the law? We're under the law towards Christ. We're under the law towards Him. Galatians 5.14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Ooh, how much do I love me? Well, some, some maybe Barna, I don't know. Somebody says about 99% of my thoughts are about me and 1% is about somebody else. I wish that was not so. I, I hope I cover it well, but you know what? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I really don't like being like that, but hey, I got to live with me. Anyways, James, James 2.8. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. So what's the royal law? What's the law of Christ? Love my neighbor as myself. Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? We're giving a whole sermon on that about the what? The good Samaritan. And the religious guys all went across the road and bypassed him. I don't want to get sticky. I don't want to be part of that. Oh, I don't really see him, you know. And they walk down the road. Of course, I've never done anything like that. You know, justified myself why I didn't love somebody. Well, the Good Samaritan was the guy that went there and what? Met his needs. Met his needs. What are the needs that are around me? What are the needs of the people around me? Certainly the gospel is one need, but sometimes I may need to meet practical needs before I'm ever going to get the opportunity to share the what? The good news of the message of the gospel. Or that I adorn the message of the gospel by doing what? Coming alongside meeting practical needs. And James tells us about that same thing, right? What good does it do to have somebody come to you and say they, they have a need for certain things, and you say, be warm, be filled, be gone. What have you done for them? Nothing. You've used flattering words. Oh, God bless you. But you didn't do anything practical. And that's when he talks about what? Faith without works is what? Is dead. It's not a vital faith. It's not a real faith. It's a dead faith. It's a hypocritical faith. It's a faith that, what, wears its doctrines on its sleeve, but never, what, picks up the burdens to do anything. Anyway, I've run that one out. He says, to the weak, all things to all men that I might save some. To the weak, that's strengthless and various applications, literal, figurative, and moral. Feeble, impotent, sick, without strength, weakness. Now, I don't know how to put that as Paul would share that with certain people, but I know sometimes I have been encouraged by those who would show a fissure, a crack in their lives. Pastor Chuck Smith did this. I remember this. He was gracious. He was merciful. And he would show certain struggles or weaknesses. Not gross, you know, flagrant, you know, rebellious kind of sins. But things he battled with occasionally would come up in his teaching. You know what that did for me? It gave me great encouragement because the Holy Spirit was all over that man. And it was like... Wow, you know, I lifted this man up high, and that was okay, you know. But when he talked about certain weaknesses, it gave me encouragement. It did not discourage me. And most of the people that I 
uh, gravitate towards as teachers and leaders are those who have little fissures that you can see the glory of God through the cracks in their lives. Right? Because uh, there's something about that that is not so much to justify sin. And most of us don't want to. But sometimes in the middle of my battle, I think I'm the only one. I'm the only one that struggles with some of the things that I struggle with. Nobody knows, right? When most of us have battles. And sometimes we just need somebody to come alongside of us and say, you know what? Without condemnation, without anything else, let me pray with you. Let me encourage you. Let me be your friend. Boy, is that so necessary. Is that so vital in the body of Christ? Doctrine's easy, folks. Love is not. Doctrine's easy. And doctrine puffs up. Love edifies. It builds up. Some of us, maybe guys in here, we can remember being young, blowing up our models. Give me some firecrackers, pew, you know, blow things up, destroy things. You know, that comes very easy. It's human nature to divide, to destroy. It takes a different nature to build, to build, to put something together, to build uh, something with different personalities and different people with different giftedness. It takes a vision beyond just the immediacy of those things. I went to go visit a friend who happened to be in Ogallala while I went to go visit, but I haven't been to this company offices for a long time. There's all these vans and all these people and all these employees. <laughs> And it's quite a company, been built. Takes effort to build. Doesn't take a lot of effort to destroy, folks. And it's hard to build because guess what? We're all different. We're all different. And it's the same in the church. And that's why it encourages us to what? Love one another. Love covers a what? Multitude of what? Sins. What is sin? Missing the mark. Am I the only one that misses the mark? No. We all miss the mark. And it's easy to destroy somebody that misses the mark. Take the law and destroy them. When quite often, I'm doing the same thing secretly, privately, but nobody gets to see because I'm pretty good at my hypocrisy. I'm real good at it. In fact, I know how to point the finger at you before it ever gets close to me. Oops, am I telling too much today? Yes, I am. So, so uh, Romans 7, 18 through 24. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. Blah! Why did I say that? Talking about your marriages, folks. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. And then I do it. Right? Hmm. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then that a law, then a law, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. How many of you will to do good? If you could keep the whole law of God in this room, you know you would be blessed. How many of you are perfect? We're not. We have this battle. And it rages. 
And it's part of our walk of faith. It's part of our growth. God doesn't just release us. Yet at the same time, there's victory. Because he'll never leave me nor forsake me. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. I agree with that. But I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity, the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And if he was just left there, he'd be a sore, sore guy. But he wasn't, and neither are we. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but the, with the flesh, the law of sin. This is Romans chapter 7. It's after chapter 6. Obviously, Dennis. Okay. Well, 6 is about victory. And then all of a sudden, Paul writes this, and then we get into verse 8, and I wanted to get to this. Um. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's chapter 8, verse 1. He wrote it right after this. And it's our battle and it's our struggle and it's the, the way that we live. It's the things that we have to do every day. And I wish I could be perfect and so do you. But I don't find that. I find quite often the same intense battle that Paul had. And I believe this was Paul as a teenager in Christ. That he got so much knowledge that guess what? But he couldn't perform on it because guess what? He wasn't leaning into what he said at the end. I thank my God through Christ Jesus. Right? And... The end goal was to save men, not more money, influence, prestige in Paul's life. It wasn't. So he doesn't say, you know, I'm doing this because, you know, I'm going to make a greater name. That would only be more work for Paul, if you consider that. If he wins more people to Christ, that's more work to do. More letters to write, more people to pray for. But that is exactly what he was inviting. And in his day and age, there was no mega churches and, you know, no five-star hotels. No, he didn't even take a salary. In fact, that's the first portion of this chapter nine. He didn't even take a salary. He had one goal, one main goal, and that was to win people to Christ, build them up in the faith, grow them up in the Lord so that they would what? Go and do the work of the ministry. That's what he tells us. So here's the crux of the matter. Paul could be offensive, but he was offensive in one area. One area. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. There's that verse. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress or push down the truth of God and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible, invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power in Godhead so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, as God nor were thankful. They became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. That's where Paul would be offensive. And the gospel is offensive. It is. Because it is what? It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And Satan rages, the battle rages for people's souls. 
over this message. It does. But nobody's going to get saved without the message of the gospel. Nobody. God doesn't work that way. He has chosen to align himself with what? His church and his spirit working through the church to present the truth of the gospel to people around us. So what do I do? How do you respond to this? It's all volunteer, folks. It's all volunteer. I'm going to read a couple of things and we'll close up here. Hopefully I can get through the last portion of this without. Ah, it's two men from my first church. Mark Morasso and Mike Borgona. They lived as neighbors in Benita, California. Nice, exclusive, somewhat exclusive area. And uh, Mark knew the Lord, him and his wife, Melinda, and they had five children. Mike Borgona grew up in a religious home up in L.A. He was a butcher for, I think, Safeway, but Alpha Beta, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I knew them after the fact of this story. And uh, Mark would go over, and Mark was an unassuming sort of a guy. He'd just go over, and Mike was always working on his yard. He was Mr. <laughs> you know, fix up the yard kind of a guy. So Mark would go over there and visit with Mike and, you know, share a little bit of Jesus with him. Splish, splash, you know. Well, Mike hated Mark. He wanted Mark to stop coming over to his house. I wish that guy just go away because he's just a nuisance to me, you know. So here's Mike loving to go out in his yard, and here comes Mark over to just hang out with him and ask him questions and be a nuisance. So Mike got this little idea. He said, okay, you know, this guy's a Christian. I bet he's a legal beagle. He said, I know what I'll do. So I'll get my six-pack of beer, and I'll go out there. And then when he comes over, I'll offer him a beer. And then he'll be offended and he'll never come back because obviously he can't drink beer because he's a Christian. Well, guess what happened? Mark took the beer from his hand, popped the top, started drinking it. Poor Mike didn't know what to do. His last little argument about what legalism and Christianity, he got saved that week over a beer. Over a man who was sensitive enough to go, the beer doesn't make a hill of beans. Mike is now a pastor to Rise in South Bay. Mark's serving the Lord with his family in another church. I got both sides of the story from both of them standing there. Mark had no idea that the beer would be such a stumbler or whatever. But God removed the final argument from Mike Bargona over a Christian that was sensitive and was willing to do what? Not make a hill of beans out of a, what? A molehill. And they're both saved. They're both serving the Lord. You know, am I telling you to go to the bar and drink? No, I'm not. It's not what enters a man that what defiles him. It's what comes out, right? This one's going to be hard. I shall never forget Easter Sunday, 1992. The day that Roberta Langella gave her dramatic testimony as I recounted in chapter three of this book. A homeless man was standing in the back of the church, listening intently. At the end of the evening meeting, I sat down on the edge of the platform, exhausted, as others continued to pray for those who had responded to Christ. The organist was playing quietly. 
I wanted to relax. I was just starting to unwind when I looked up to see this man with shabby clothing, matted hair, standing in the center aisle about four rows back waiting for permission to approach me. I nodded and gave him a weak little wave of my hand. Look at how this Easter Sunday is going to end, I thought to myself. He's going to hit me up for money. That happens often in this church. I'm so tired. When he came close, I saw that his two front teeth were missing. But more striking was his odor. The mixture of alcohol, sweat, urine, and garbage took my breath away. I have been around many street people, but this was the strongest stench I had ever encountered. I instinctively had to turn my head sideways to inhale, then look back in his direction. I asked his name, David, he said softly. How long have you been homeless, David? Six years. Where did you sleep last night in an abandoned truck? I had heard enough and wanted to get this over quickly. I reached for the money clip in my back pocket. At that moment, David put his fingers in front of my face and said, no, you don't understand. I don't want your money. I'm going to die out there. I want the Jesus that redhead girl talked about. I hesitated, then closed my eyes. God, forgive me. I begged. I felt soiled and cheap. Me, a minister of the gospel. I had wanted simply to get rid of him when he was crying out for the help of Christ. I had just preached about. I swallowed hard as God's love flooded my soul. David sensed the change in me. He moved toward me and fell on my chest, burying his grimy head against my white shirt and tie. Holding him close, I talked with him about Jesus' love. These weren't just words. I felt them. I felt love for this pitiful young man. And that smell, I don't know how to explain it, it had almost made me sick, but now it became the most beautiful fragrance to me. I reveled in what had been repulsive just a moment ago. The Lord seemed to say to me in that instant, Jim, if you and your wife have any value to me, if you have any purpose in my work, it has to do with this odor. This is the smell of the world I died for. David surrendered to Christ. He heard about that night. He gave him, he, we got him into a hospital detoxification unit for a week. We got his teeth fixed. He joined the prayer brand right away. He spent the next Thanksgiving in our home. We invited him back for Christmas as well. I will never forget his present to me. Inside a little box was one handkerchief. It was all he could afford. Today, David heads up the maintenance department of the church, overseeing 10 other employees. He is now married and a father. And God is opening more and more doors for him to go out and give his testimony. When he speaks, his words have a weight and an impact that many ordained ministers would covet. I read this Thursday, front room, and I sobbed. When I first got saved, I loved people. My heart has grown cold and calloused. I'm just being honest. I know what I've been called to do. 
Let's give my life away. I'm a volunteer. I cannot volunteer you. I cannot tell you what to do. I can love on you. I can pray for you. I can teach you the word of God the best I know how. But I know I ask God to change my heart. Because it ain't right. I pass people every day. And I'm not talking about Davids that stink and are filthy. I mean, people in high i I've been privileged. I know a handful of millionaires in the city. I drive down the road. I'm just about me most of the time. So I'll leave you with that because I have my own thoughts i got to deal with with this. So Jonathan, would you come up and lead us in a song? I don't even have a prayer. <laughs>